Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 9 for our first scripture. Chapter 9. Such a great narrative here of one who was blind from birth, as are we all born in this world, sons of Adam, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ exercising his authority and power to heal such a one who was blind physically and yet clearly was one of the Lord's. And compared to those religious fanatics and self-justifying leaders of the day that could see physically and yet were blind spiritually. So it says that as Jesus passed by, no, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. The man could not see our Lord. But our Lord had his eye on the blind man, such as our case. We could never see the Lord in our blindness, and yet if God purposed to save us in Christ and chose us, then when Christ passed by, he sees each one that the Father gave him. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's natural thinking, that if someone is physically blind, they must have done something wrong, or their parents. And so they ask our Lord the question, and Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, he's talking about in the sense of, for the reason of being born blind physically, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. A lot of people question why it is that God would create a fallen world. Right here in verse 3 is the answer, that the works of God should be made manifest even in this fallen world. Even before Christ came, the Father purposed to honor his Son, what would be a savior without sinners? What would be salvation without sin? Just to deliver from that sin. What would be grace unless there were condemnation? So that's important, that the works of God, that should be the only answer that is ever needed. Why is the world the way it is? That the works of God should be made manifest in this world. Christ saving whom he will, and condemning whom he will. But he says, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. He's speaking there of his coming to earn and establish that righteousness that the Father purposed that he should work out. While it is day, in other words, during that appointed time, the night cometh, in other words, speaking there of his death, as that dark hour when no man can work. You can't add to or take from the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that he came to accomplish. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. It doesn't say that he just points sinners to the light. No, he is the light. You can have the light shining all you want to, but if you don't have eyes to see, you'll never see it. So he's the light of the world, but he's the one who gives eyes to see. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Here we see that Christ, as the creator of this world, uses all things to his own purpose and glory. Some say, well, couldn't he have just spoken the word and the man would have seen? Yes. But here he purposed that... He should take clay from the earth and spit on it and anoint the eyes of the blind man with the clay. There's a lot of picture in there of the clay representing that which is dead. But when the Lord is pleased to use it as the creator to anoint the eyes of a blind man, that clay serves his purpose as he directs. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. You got a 
picture of the work of the Holy Spirit and the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Spirit. All of these represented of the work of Christ. And the neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? That's all we are by nature is beggars. We have nothing with which to give ourselves life. And some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. That's the testimony of one that the Lord has been pleased to deliver from darkness and bring to light. That is an object of God's mercy and grace gladly declares, no, I am he. It's like we sing Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We have no problems at all owning what we were and what we are. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? And he answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Here's a simple testimony of a man that the Lord has delivered. He knew who it was that had delivered him. His name is Jesus, which means Savior. Jehovah saves. And the fact that he made clay and anointed my eyes, it describes him then as the creator. He's not only the deliverer, the Savior, but the creator, using all things to his glory. <coughs> and, and that same one that, that spoke in the world was, this whole world belongs unto him. He it is that took that very clay that he had made and anointed mine eyes. And I went and washed and received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. See, the Lord had been pleased to reveal just so much of himself to this blind man. But it didn't require him to know all things. Where is he? I know not. That shows the honesty. He wasn't trying to convince these others or gain their favor. Simply, I just have declared what I know. And so they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And even our Lord at this point withdrawing himself, he didn't abandon this blind man, but he withdrew himself and in this time was now drawing these Pharisees. God works through his son, not only in the Deliverance of the blind man, but even in those that oppose, directing all things. So they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. That was a point of contention at all points with the Pharisees that the Lord would dare heal anybody on the Sabbath day. They counted that a work, but they didn't see that. Here, he's the Lord of the Sabbath, just as he's the creator, he's the deliverer, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he put clay upon my eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day, by their estimation. Again, here's where the traditions of men stand in opposition to the person of Christ and his work. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. That's the way it always is, where Christ is pleased to work. He leaves some to their darkness, just like these Pharisees. They had physical eyes to see, and yet their spiritual eyes were darkened. And then there's others that he works his grace in so that even though they may not have great understanding of who he is, yet they acknowledge that this man can't be a sinner by men's estimates. It was impossible that Christ should ever be a sinner. He took upon him the sin of his people, but he never became a sinner, even though many would have accused him for that. And they say unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him? See, the 
direction of their question is a good question, but unless the Spirit of Christ gives understanding, no one will know it. What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thy eyes? And so again, this blind man declared what the Lord had been pleased to teach him to that point. He said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, is this your son? Who you say was born blind, how then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. This is all of us by nature. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. They were obliged to declare their own ignorance as to how this could be. Or who hath opened his eyes? We know not. He's of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Here again is a clear example that any that the Lord teaches, you don't have to teach them a script of what to say or prepare them what to say, what the Lord's done. Now they'll testify. If you're a witness of something, it's of what you've known and seen and heard. And that's the way it is with any of the Lord's. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. You can see right here the opposition of these Pharisees. It wasn't out of ignorance that they were asking these things, but they opposed Christ already in their heart. There was that spirit of Antichrist in them. Therefore said his parents, he's of age, ask him. They were trying to get out from under the scrutiny, fearing for their own lives more than the honor of Christ. And that's the way people are, because the Lord has not taught. But this blind man did not hesitate. Then called, again called they, the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. That shows their own Ignorance right there, making a distinction between God and this man. Those taught of the Spirit know he's the God man. And just as God is holy and just and right in all things, so is his son. But men will try to make a, a difference. And he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Another simple testimony. And we must also beware when people ask us of the difference. To try to get too much into the detail of, well, this is where I was and, and break it all down. A lot, a lot of preachers try to do that, defining or attempting to define what the work of Christ is in their own heart. I love this simple answer. Whereas I was blind, now I see. How did we get eyes to see Christ and be able to honor him? It's in him having revealed himself in us. Then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? There is again, more people concerned about the how rather than the who. And he answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Why are you asking? What's your motive? What's your purpose? It's not by reasoning that we come to know who Christ is. It's by revelation. People want to try to reason out the doctrine of Christ and reason out the great subject even of election from eternity and salvation accomplished there at the cross. They're trying to logically figure it out. But he very boldly asks them, well, why do you want it? No, will you also be his disciples? That'd be a good question to ask people when they begin to interrogate us. Why are you asking? Is it for your own understanding, knowledge? What, what are you going to do with it? Or is it truly to know Christ and him crucified? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. There's that 
divide again that comes where people think that Moses had one teaching in Christ another. No. John wrote about that, that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by the Lord Jesus Christ, the fulfillment, the accomplishment of that law. In fact, Christ said, if you believe Moses, you believe me, because he wrote with me. You can't go anywhere in Scripture where Christ is not the subject. And they, but they, they made a distinction. We know that God spake unto Moses, and notice their disdain for Christ, as for this fellow. We know not from whence he is, and nor did they desire to know. All they desired was to be rid of him. That's that spirit of Antichrist. And that's the way in many congregations today. They'll come and listen to all kinds of topics being taught out of the Bible, but don't you dare stand up and declare Christ and him crucified every time you stand up to preach. It'll bring a divide. And that man answered and said unto them, why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. <laughs> it's a mystery, but it's a marvelous thing. But you're not interested in him who opened my eyes. By your questions, you want to argue and debate against it. Now, we know that God hears not sinners. This is an amazing testimony. If he were a sinner, God would not hear him. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Well, to be a worshiper of God is to worship him in Christ. And to do his will is to hear Christ. And those that the Lord by his spirit so directs to worship him in spirit and in truth, he's heard, God hears him because of Christ as that mediator, as that intercessor. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And I say the same thing. If your little Jesus cannot accomplish what he will, when he will, and how he will, then he's no Christ at all. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Actually, that was a mercy that the Lord so directed that they would show their opposition to the Christ who had come and delivered him, that they would cast him out of their midst. There's no mixing of works and grace. You can't dwell together. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, there it is again. First he saw him in his blindness, and now we see him as the shepherd finding him. He'll always seek out his sheep. And he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? That's an honest answer. He knew him to be a prophet. He knew him to be one that could not be a sinner, and they could not have done what he did were not God with him. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. But now the Lord continues to teach him when he says, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? That's a strong term there that means to be the Son of God, means to be God. And he said, Who is he, Lord? that I might believe on him. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Imagine his delight now, because the Lord had spit on his on the mud and covered his eyes, but then he had to find his way to that pool of Siloam. Because when he was washed, he could see, but he had never physically set eyes on Christ to that point. So, it makes sense. He said, well, who, who is he that I might believe on? And that shows, too, that Christ in the flesh, there was no distinguishing feature about him, like a halo over his head or some kind of light that followed him around for people to identify who he was. He was God in the flesh. And yet, the only way that any could know him in truth was by him revealing himself. It says, Thou hast seen him, and it is he that talked with thee. And you look at his response. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him.
That's always the effect of Christ revealing himself in a sinner. One for whom Christ would pay his sin debt is that they bow and worship him. And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world. I'm not talking about judgment in the sense of destroying the world. But the judgment here in verse 39, that they which see not might see. And they which see might be made blind. He says, they that see not, it's talking about people born blind, just like this man from birth, and yet they're made to see Christ. And yet others who say they see, they set themselves as teachers of the of sinners, yet that they might be made blind. That judgment is, the condemnation is that the light has come to the world, but men of love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? They weren't asking out of need, but more out of contesting who he was. And Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind and knew it, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. That right there shows his condemnation over these, that even though he would lay down his life to pay the sin debt of many such as these that he purposed to save, yet they and their self-righteousness, their sin would remain. Because the only thing that can ever take away sin is the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word, how marvelous it is to see how your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to this world to save sinners. And if we have benefited from that salvation, we must add, of whom I am chief. And yet it's by your grace that any of us see. It's by your grace that any of us have had that sin removed because of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can but bow and worship you through him. And thanking you that you did not leave us to ourselves. So as we continue our time of worship, we say with the hymn writer, open our eyes, that we may see wondrous things in the law and the word concerning you and concerning your son. Be our teacher. Please don't leave us to ourselves. We give you the praise, honor, and glory in our dear Savior's name. Amen.